Welcome to the Stanford's Travel Writers Festival and this event telling the story of China. But first, a little something to whet your appetite. In this series, for the first time on TV, we're going to tell the story of China from its ancient roots to the present day. The events and the ideas that have shaped the Chinese people. I'm Michael Wood and we're here in China at a great farmer's festival in the plain of the Yellow River with a million people all around me. China's the country that we all want to know about today. But if you want to understand China now, you need to know about its history. And it's an astonishing history of incredible drama and triumphs and tragedies. China has been a unified state for more than 2,000 years, far longer than anywhere else on the planet. China as the world's first centralized bureaucratic empire begins here. And in this series, we'll show you how that tradition developed. We'll tell the tale of the great rulers who shaped China was suspicious, coarse, brutal, utterly ruthless, but a creative genius. The scientists and inventors who lived before the rise of the West. And the Chinese people themselves will help us tell the tale. <laughs> <laughs> we can take you into the streets of China a thousand years ago and right into its most famous restaurants. As historical sources go, this is one of the most fabulous that exist in the world. It's a scroll, a portrait of the life of the city. But China's story is also a cycle of revolution and war. Just imagine the scene. Inside the walls of the inner city are hundreds of thousands of terrified citizens of Kaifeng, still resisting hopelessly. And the government try to buy off the invaders, but there are no cards left to play. When they give gold, the invaders want more. And they want people. They want craftsmen. But especially, they want women. China's view of the world has been molded by war and foreign invasion. <laughs> but its people have always come through. It's a 4,000-year epic of invention and creativity. The six masks, the tallest one, 38 meters. Great sea voyages long before America was discovered. And brilliant arts and sciences long before the Renaissance in Europe. You know, here is a dragon. Yeah! It's a China you've never seen before. A portrait of a nation of crucial importance to the world. Whose history is the key to understanding its people today. So, come with us on this great adventure. The story of China. And this is just the beginning. Please welcome now author, historian, filmmaker and broadcaster Michael Wood talking with Paul Blazard. Hello, everybody, and a very warm welcome back to the Stanford's Travel Writers Festival of 2021. It's first digital edition brought to you not from the hallowed portals of London's fabulous Olympia, uh, but largely from our uh, our own domestic settings. I'm uh, beaming to you for live from very rural Warwickshire. Michael, where do we find you? I'm in North London, actually, Paul, although I envy you uh, being in rural Warwickshire, which is one of my favourite places. You know, you can travel as profitably and as excitingly in your own backyard, can't you? And... Uh, I don't want to sound like a 
a geek, but uh, um, I've made eight films in rural Warwickshire on Shakespeare and his context and his family. And um, yeah, I have many good friends in Warwickshire, as Shakespeare says. Ah, many good friends in Warwickshire, exactly. Yes, I'm uh, I'm here due to being locked down with my 81-year-old dad, but there are worse places to be locked down and I am rather grateful to be here. Some lovely walks. Now, ladies and gentlemen, normally I would introduce Michael Wood by telling you what you already know. He's an inter internationally acclaimed historian, filmmaker and broadcaster, the author of several best-selling books, including four UK, three Sunday Times, number one bestsellers, and a man who has made over well over 100 documentary films, hailed as some of the most innovative history programmes ever on TV by The Independent, including those on The Footsteps of Alexander, The Great, and The Story of Inda, which the Wall Street Journal described as still the gold standard of documentary history. I would also tell you that he's received the British Academy President's Medal for Services to History and Outreach, that he's a Fellow of the Royal Society of the Arts, the Royal History Historical Society and the Society of Antiquaries. Antiquaries, Antiquaries or Antiquaries? We'll, we'll cover that within a minute. But you know all that already. What you may not know is in a recent edition of Desert Island Discs on BBC Radio 4, where the subject of Desert Island Discs was David Olasoga. He described Michael Wood thus, and that is how I'm going to introduce you to Michael Wood, the coolest historian ever to have been, or to have ever been. Michael, it's a delight to see you. Thank you so much for taking the time to come to join us at the Edward Stanford, Stanford Writing Festival. Um, have, um, have your children suddenly realised the worth of their father now that you are the coolest historian to have ever been? Well, it was really, it was really funny, actually. My my kids, who of course are old now, but they're they're big fans of David Olashoga, so and they listen to Desert Island Discs. So um, I was getting emojis with thumbs ups and smiles, saying, uh, you know, this makes you sound cool, Dad. <laughs> well, you're always cool in this house, not least for your love of Warwickshire. Let's come to the book. Um, Michael's latest book, I'm going to hold it up, although you will better see it on screen, I'm sure, is entitled The Story of China, and therein lies a tale. Uh, I read in the introduction that this book came, the inspiration for this book came from the series of films that you made between 2014 and 2017 for the BBC and for PBS. Can you tell us how those films were received in China and how that led to you writing this book? Well, it's a very interesting story. Um, because, as you know, um, no Western film can be received in, um, freely in China without mediation of some kind or other. But the, the Internet is so enormous in China and the ease with which, especially by sharp young people, that the, the great firewall can be broken meant that within 36 hours, every episode of the story of China was up on Chinese sites with a full Chinese subtitling, incredibly. Some of these sites actually carrying the, um, uh, the comments and the discussions of the, the viewers, you know. So in no time at all, even though the series had not been seen on terrestrial broadcasting, we were actually being approached for interviews by the China Daily and Xinhua News Agency and the People's Daily and uh, just one after another, and they all wanted to know. And, and in fact, the crazy thing was, I, I went, I think, 2017 or 18 to do a series of films about the opening up of China 40 years ago. And our co-producer there said, you're not going to believe this, but President Xi Jinping's been talking about the, for your films in a festival about TV and documentary making. So we found ourselves in this strange situation that... Uh, um, the, the films really kind of took off in China, even though within, I guess, within a day or m more, the, the sequence about Tiananmen Square at the end was cut out. Uh, that's, you know, the, the government wouldn't allow that to stay up on, on, um, on, you know, on websites or stuff like that. But there's a big audience out there. And, uh, I mean, the Chinese publishers want to publish the book, but again, they've told me we can't publish the last two chapters, which contain a lot of even new stuff on Tiananmen Square and um, inside documents from the Chinese government, you know, leaked documents and material like that. So you always face this with China. Um, 
I just did a film about China's greatest poet, Du Fu, which again is a journey film, as you know. I, I'm, I love journeys. Journeys are a great way of making films. And we followed the route of China's greatest poet, Du Fu, and it's a wonderful story. And Sir Ian McKellen did you know, fabulous readings of the poetry. And again, the, the, the response in China to the BBC version, two months before it was shown on Chinese te television, was huge. And again, we were inundated by uh, responses from the Chinese media. And in fact, of the story of China, the Xinhua News Agency, which is the biggest Chinese news agency, wrote this review, which was one of the best reviews I've ever had, actually, Paul. It's amazing. They said uh, that the film had transcended the barriers of of race and la language and culture and ethnicity, I think is the way they put it, and produced something that was inexplicably moving to the television audience. And that re really echoed what a lot of Chinese viewers had said to us, that, that it made them feel very moved by the power of some of the stories, some of which they hadn't really thought about in that way themselves. So it's been a fantastic experience actually doing this stuff, even though it's a lot of bad news coming from China now, as you know. And uh, and I don't think even now it would be possible to work as freely as we did. You know, in the end, they weren't even sending somebody to supervise us on the story of China. And, and that just wouldn't happen anymore. That's extraordinary. On a personal note, Michael, can I ask you this, just while we're talking about this, to get reviews like that, when you have told, and you're telling the history of a people that are not your own, a nation that is not your own, and history was such a broad sweep. That must be incredibly gratifying to a communicator of history. That must be a moment when you sort of go, yes, I, I did that. My place in this earth is, is worthwhile. It was, um, you know, we're just TV makers, filmmakers. We, we, we make stuff and we put it out. And if the audience uh, like it, that's great. Uh, I've always, of my, being of my generation, believed in Sir John Reith's dictum about the BBC 100 years ago. Its purpose was to inform, to educate and to entertain. And uh, so uh, that, that kind of response uh, was very, very touching. And it's a kind of effort that you make uh, to put yourself in the shoes of another culture because you think of yourself, you know, I'm a middle-aged, white, middle-class Brit making films in India or somewhere like that. If if the people whose culture you're making the film about look at it and go, well, that wasn't worth doing, was it? You know, th there's no point to it, it seems to me. So, um, yeah, I was very, very touched by the Chinese audience response that in some way the film said it touched m collective memories almost, as well as the individual stories that are still there in China and suddenly had an, an emotional flow because, you know, the way we make documentaries in the West, you like a history film to have an emotional uh, feeling as well, you know, that you, you... But that's what we do history for, isn't it? If you love the past, you're interested in the people of the past, you want to hear the voices of the people of the past. How did they feel? What was life like for them? How did they cope with these incredible events that they, they, they went through? And to show their common humanity. And that was another theme of the Chinese viewers who in a time when China has been really demonized in this last year because of COVID, uh, it was one of the themes of their response to the Dufu film as well as the story of China that, um, um, you know, they felt it was kind of, it had a humaneness to it. And uh, so you know, that's what we, you try and do as a filmmaker, isn't it? And films are a combination of things. They're words, they're pictures, obviously, they're sounds, they're music. And it's the combination of those things that makes something work. You know, when Xinhua News Agency said it was kind of in inexplicably moving, what they're really referring to is how cleverly the uh, our composer wrote the music and how cleverly our editor edited the pictures to go with the timing of the words you know that you that's that's how it works isn't it of course but the baseline structure is yours and the the subtitle for this the structure of this is a portrait of a civilization and its people and when the civilization goes back to what is it the earliest recorded use of rice as a foodstuff 8000 bc or 6000 bc 
Can you just give us some insights as to when you are thinking, you are sitting at your desk thinking, right, I'm going to write a portrait of a civilization, it's people, it's the story of China. How the hell am I going to do this? I know that you have a sort of filmic mind and you do sort of close-ups on people and so on, but how do you, what was the strategy that you deployed in order to cover almost what is the uncoverable? It's selection is everything, isn't it, in a book like this? Um, you know, I'm sure if you were to talk to Peter Frankopan about his Silk Road book or Tom Holland about Dominion, where he's covering the whole of history of the West, selection is everything. And the stories that you're going to tell, you have to tell stories, I think. And uh, But it was a, obviously a big task because the history of China is as big as the history of the West. And, uh, um, you know, the poetic tradition in China is older than Homer's Iliad, the surviving poetry, you know, the, the sheer quantity and quality of the material is, is, is staggering. The other daunting thing, given that, you know, I'd thought about this while we were making the films between 2014 and 16, 17, when they went out in the States. And I'd written, I drafted a couple of chapters, but it was too big a task. I thought, I there's no point trying to rush it as a TV book, you know. So um, I put it aside and then everybody said, after the films went out, you know, come on. And it was a, it was a huge job because the amount of new material is so staggering. And the new material extends from leaked, a leaked letter by the Chinese generals asking the government not to intervene at Tiananmen Square with troops, you know, staggering stuff came out only last summer ago. Um, but amazing material from the Han Dynasty and the Qin, you know, the real life soldiers of the terracotta army, as it were, but letters writing home to mum, asking mum to um, go to the market and get textiles to make some clothes for them and asking about Auntie Gushu and is the marriage on and what's happening, you know, um, and this material only just published. So a staggering range of stuff. So you have to focus on certain key stories, I think, and obviously you can't miss certain key parts of the tale. Um, uh, the Tang Dynasty, for example, the age of Beowulf in Britain, you know, between the 600s and, and 900. Uh, you ask most Chinese people, and I, I speak as someone who actually did once stand in the Shanghai Expo and for a couple of hours vox popped Chinese tourists with what's your favorite period of history, you know, and, uh, and most of them, <laughs> and most of them said the Tang Dynasty, you know, and why? Well, it was, it was great. China had a great culture, a great civilization. And the art, and especially the poetry. You see, we all still love the poetry of Du Fu and Li Bai and all that. But it was also, people said, the time when China went out to the world on the Silk Road, and the world came to China. And, uh, uh, you know, the better educated among our Vox poppers knew that, uh, you know, a Christian mission had come in 635 to Xi'an and, and the emperor had the gospels translated and allowed them to build a church in Xi'an. And you think, would that have happened in Dark Age Winchester? You know, so, um, so uh, you can't miss out. You can't miss out those great stories. The real issue is, uh, I think, is, is before that, how you handle the huge sweep of the early history of China, which can be daunting, is mainly based on archaeology. Uh, and, but of course, there have been some amazing archaeological finds but recently about that. But what I, um, what I was interested in was the, the mythic, how the mythic history could still be reflected in the living culture. Because one of the things we've always tried to do in our films and it's something that I've always loved whenever I travel, is that you're not, you're not looking just to see a, a famous monument. What you're looking for, if, you, if, if it's at all possible, is to sense the continuity of the past in the living culture, the, the life of the past still there. And I've made lots of films trying to do that in different times and it's it's perfectly possible in many places i mean the island where we go on holiday in greece in the cyclades had an oracle until 1963 and the old people in the island still have the ancient taboos 
uh, and uh, so th th these things still exist. And despite the 30 years of Mao and communism, the, the culture of China still exists. And I remember going in the early 80s thinking that Maoism and the devastation of the Cultural Revolution had destroyed, must have destroyed all that. You know, you met the odd Taoist hermit on a mountain, you know, who were outside society. But of course, the moment that it's possible to bring these things back, they, they come back. And there's a, a scene in the book where you go in, a, in the middle of a rural Hernan to a farmer's festival where a million people have gone to the shrine of the goddess Nuwa, and all kinds of unbelievable things are, are happening that you never dreamed still existed. And that's just one of many, many places in China. So the culture is more robust than we think, despite the devastations of the communists. And, uh, um, and of course, now it's allowed to flourish again, as long as it's not a critique of the government. The, you know, as, as long as it behaves itself. So I, I partly homed in on one or two of the great myths that th seem to me to be culture myths, you know, the myth of the great King Yu, who, who um, controlled the flood and devised systems of irrigation. And it's a kind of mythic tale. And yet at the same time, it resonates a transformation in China or just after 2000 BC, which where you see the first dynasties emerge. And uh, so telling a story, uh, but as you say, that's how we TV folk do these things. You know, we tell that story in the film and uh, um, it's a very nice way of focusing in on an emblematic tale. Nicely put, Michael. Can we have a look at your relation, tell the story of your relationship with China if memory serves, somewhere in the introduction, you say that you shared a residence when I think a postcard student at Oxford with a, somebody who was a sign of all, who introduced you to the poetry of Dufu. If I remember remember that correctly, can you talk us through the link between that and then your first sure. own first travel to China, what your expectations were, sure. what you actually saw? Um, yeah, my first encounter with Chinese poetry, and I've no I've no explanation for this. Why? as a 16 year old in Manchester in the bookshop in Market Street or Cross Street one day, I picked up the new Penguin Classics, Tang Poetry, Poetry of Poems of the Late Tang. And there was Du Fu and Du Mu and some of these great poets. And I remember opening the book and you know that thing where you, you, find, you meet a book, if you like, that opens a window to a world that you never dreamed existed. And for me, it was it was so amazing. I, I even I can remember trying to imitate Tang Dynasty poetry in the school magazine, you know, stuff like that in the school literary magazine. But that was the, the first thing you think, this is fantastic. And I've loved that book all my life and often given it as a present. And then when I went to Oxford as a postgraduate, when I was working on 10th century Britain, you know, I shared a house with a German sinologist who became a very eminent prof in Europe. And he was forever shoving books my way, going, you're going to love this. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and I did. You know, it's a, very, it's a great thing, isn't it, when somebody pushes a book your way that you just go, wow. And, uh, and actually, at that time, all sorts of interesting people used to come through our kitchen. And one of them was this guy, David Hawkes who had written a book on Dufu and uh, um, a, little, a little guide to Dufu almost, a beautiful book. But Hawkes had been in Tiananmen Square when the Chinese Republic was declared in 1949. He'd been a student then. And, and I remember saying to him, uh, so what do you do then, David? And he said, well, I used to be a professor of Chinese in the University of Oxford, actually. <laughs> you know? um, but I gave it all up, he said, to translate the novel of the millennium. And you go, wow! And of course, that was the dream. Of, uh, that was the dream of the Red Chamber, which is five volumes in Penguin Classics, and uh, and Hawks did that. So the, these are eye-opening experiences, aren't they? You know, for a for a young person, and it, there, there is a world elsewhere, as Shakespeare says. And um, uh, and I think uh, I first went to China in the early eighties, 
And uh, just when Xinjiang in the West opened up, that first year it opened up, I went out to Kashgar. And uh, it was a wonderful experience. Everybody has different experiences to different cultures, don't they? If you're travelers, you know, we're all today travelers in our different ways, aren't we? We're all people who love traveling and being in cultures, not just trying to see them from the outside. We all know what a privilege it is to be welcomed into a culture and explained things. And, and I remember quite a lot of people have, that I've met have been a bit frosty about China and think the Chinese are difficult to get to know and I don't warm to it. Whereas my experience of China back then was I really warmed to it. I, I, I loved the sociability of the people and uh, their love of being together, eating together, uh, you know. And um, I, I remember leaving that first time with a sense of, uh, you know, hoping I would go back. And that has carried on. I mean, I, I think since 2014, I've done a, maybe a dozen or 15 maybe journeys to China. And uh, I remember after we finished the film, as friends saying, oh, you must be glad that's over. And I, I said, no, I, I can't wait to go back. Let me ask you this. It's not a question I scripted. I tend not to script questions. I'd much rather it was a conversation. And this is the example of why. What is the mistake given what you now know about China, given your travels there, given your associations with the people and your you know, deep immersion in everything from its poetry from an early age for you, what is the mistake or the misconception that most people in the West have that makes them say that? Oh, you must be relieved that's over and that you're back home. I mean, that's an appalling thing to say. Yeah, I mean, I think they simply meant, that, you know, it can be grueling to uh, work for long periods in China and travel long distances. It's, uh, you know, it wasn't entirely casting aspersions on the Chinese people, I think. But I think people do feel, uh, some people I've met feel China's, Chinese are difficult to get to know. Um, and I think, I think the mistake is, you know, you shouldn't, should never judge cultures from the outside, should you? And you, 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 you should get to know people, put yourself in their shoes and, understand a bit of how they see the world once you do that you you the world seems different open yourself up to the place that you find yourself in allow yourself to be a part of it rather than making it a, and then in so you make it a part of you i think so i mean if I, to, to add to that if i may the i mean we're at a travel we're at a travel festival as it were and a festival of travel literature and um, and that's true of, to me, of any culture and a landscape that you travel in. Obviously, some are richer and older than others, no, no doubt. And uh, China's a huge civilization, with millions of people, you know. But uh, um, I, I, I've just been putting together a, an idea for a podcast and going back over things, travels that I've done. It's a it's about travels um, and going back over things that I've written that I've not used or thought about. And, and uh, here was one in the Cuzco Valley in, in Peru. You know, here was one in southern Iraq. Uh, here was one in Devon. And, and in each case, uh, the landscape the flora and fauna, the trees, the way people have cultivated the life that's been lived in these places for so long. Um, the whole world, the world is a wonderful place and full of literal wonders. And that's what great travel literature does, isn't it? It t tells you that, it brings it to you. And uh, so I'm not lauding China above anywhere else. I'm just saying that, of course, it's fifth of the world so it's incomparably rich and wonderful in its culture but um, that experience can be there for for um, for any traveler who is prepared to just get under the skin of it and put themselves in the shoes of the people there learn a bit about them learn a little bit about their language um, and, and miraculously even in the 21st century as you know paul you know if you think of southern India, for example, these are um, places where the older view of the of the universe still pertains. 
I once made an, an analogy with uh, the rainforests and that, uh, you know, that human, human cultures are like rainforests of the spirit and they're being cut down as well. That's a beautiful analogy. Human cultures are like the rainforest of the spirit. There was a piece I wanted to pick you up, not pick you up on, but tease apart with you if I may. Somewhere, either in the blurb of this book or within the book itself, forgive me for not remembering, There's, it's a big chunky book. Most of it's committed to memory, but not enough, I fear. But you say somewhere that to understand the story of humanity is impossible without understanding something of China. Can you unpack what you mean by that for us a little, please? Because I, I feel there's a, a profoundness there which is vitally important and going to be vitally important for us for the next 50 years, 100 years or so. I think you're right. Um, and it is very important. When I was a student, there was a great uh, Sinologist called Simon Lays, L-E-Y-S. That, that was a pseudonym because he'd been banned from going into China because of his criticisms of the communists in it, book, first books he wrote in the late 60s. But uh, and he died recently. Um, taught in Australia and he, his books are really really fantastic books and in one of his essays he says that China is the other pole of the human spirit and that uh, unless you understand something of China you can't understand humanity in its fullness uh, you can't understand what I think he says is is merely Western idiosyncrasy and what is actually common values of the whole of humanity. And he says that even, even cultures like Islam and India, because they share certain things with the West, you know, the monotheistic, the Indo-European, even there, uh, although perhaps Southern India, you and I might feel, is separate from the Sanskritic world of uh, of northern India, but essentially he's saying that even those even those um, uh, cultures, uh, different as they may be in some ways, are too close to us for us to truly understand. So we can't understand our own humanity without understanding uh, the fullness of Chinese civilization. And I think that's very interesting. We take and his remark about Western idiosyncrasy struck me as well. You know, we take certain things as red, don't we? The West, the West, from all along, for instance, has taken monotheism as a, as its, uh, as the structure of the world. But the East, as you know, uh, never had the idea of a creator God, uh, and never had the idea that morality was something that was theologically given down to humanity. You know, Confucius doesn't talk about the gods. He doesn't talk about the afterlife. He's talking about what, how to live a good life on earth, you know. The Buddha, the Buddha would say the same. So, um, and you could see monotheism as a Near Eastern stroke Western um, civilizational specific, if you like. And I remember once somebody, I was in Banaras by the banks of the Ganges and uh, talking to an old uh, scholar of Sanskrit. And he was talking about this great French uh, um, musicologist and Sanskritologist called Alain Danielou, who was a very, very famous scholar. And Danielou came from a top family in France. His brother was a cardinal, and you know that was the world of the Catholic France that he came from. But he fell in love with India, and he stayed in India through the 30s and and through the Second World War. And, decide, and in the end was initiated by the sadhus of the Shaivite sect right into the heart of uh, you know, Shaivite mysticism and all that. And he, in one of his last books, actually went so far as, I don't know what his brother thought about this, but he said that monotheism was a moral error. <laughs> and, and in one sense, when you, look at the clim when you look at the climate crisis, I'm not taking sides here. I mean, I'm just remarking. You, this is all in answer to your question about different views of different civilizations and how we, one must be aware of the baggage that we carry. Um, but I think uh, these are interesting. These are interesting questions. Yeah, the idea of a creator God who made hum, hum, humanity in His image and gave them the world to do to to control. It's so alien to Eastern religions. That's an interesting question. 
I think that's also the clue into getting into breaking out of Western idiosyncrasies, to use Simon Lay's uh, quote, and starting to understand, understand what China is, where it came from, why the mysticism still counts. I like your mention of the fact that you know, the mysticism did not disappear with Mao and the Cultural Revolution. It is still there. Where is it now? Where is China now? The, the sort of the rise of the Han, the rise of Jinping, this sort of cult of personality that's going on, cult of, perhaps I put that wrong, sort of, it's a sort of an internal xenophobia in a way against anybody who isn't Han. Where does that put China with its, in its relationship with its own past, with its own grand and much lauded past from the West? Do they still respect their own past? Do they know from whence they came? Sorry, a very compound portmanteau question, Michael. Um, of course, the, the, you know, one of the planks of the current government, which depends on continued growth, the continued monopoly of power of the Communist Party, but one of the planks is the greatness of Chinese civilization that they push in every way, in schools, in the press, in the TV, and... Uh, uh, you know, it's one of the big things President Xi is very keen on and the distinctiveness of Chinese civilization. They've been pushing very hard the idea that democracy is a Western uh, idiosyncrasy and is not the Chinese way. This is not how the Chinese have done it. And, of course, they've been making a meal out of events like, uh, well, Washington last week even, you know. Uh, God, this is this is what happens with democracy. Brexit, all these things. This is what happens with democracy. You know, um, uh, you're safer with a stable one-party state. This is what they continually push. Uh, but of course, Chinese culture is is and civilization is much more varied than um, the Communist Party's view of it. <laughs> and, uh, there've been critiques of the imperial system running right back in time you know and very vociferous ones from the 17th century onwards the um you remarked on the cult of the ruler and i think that's one of the things i've picked up in the book is that the the idea of the the all-knowing wise all-powerful ruler who uh, looks after affairs presides over affairs was part of the imperial cult during the the empire. That was the status of the emperor with his counselors. And um, and it didn't go with the end of the empire in 1911 11 to 12. Uh, the Republic briefly tried to reorganize Chinese society, but of course they faced incredible difficulties, peasant uprisings, communist uprisings, then the invasion by the Japanese. Uh, the, the, it, it was a hopeless task even though people were still full of hope in the 1940s as to how a democratic Chinese republic might emerge. But Mao, Chairman Mao, and even and now even Xi Jinping, seemed to be, certainly Chairman Mao, re-embodied the imperial cult of the sage ruler. And you get those endless Communist Party things about Chairman Mao in the, the Cultural Revolution, the Red Guards, Chairman Mao, the sun rises as you rise, all rivers flow to the east, you are the all-seeing, the all-generous, the all-mighty, uh, the kind, the, the, you know, this, this eulogy of the, the, the emperor, you could have found the same words about Mao on some of the tyrannical Ming Dynasty emperors 500 years before. And Deng Xiaoping, after Mao's death, who instituted the reform and opening up just over 40 years ago, was very sceptical about this. He was a communist. He was a Communist Party man, but privately was horrified by the cult of Mao and by many areas in which the whole thing had gone wrong and how the cult of Mao had contributed to the Cultural Revolution, how adulation of Mao had led to the failure of voices to stand against the, the great leap forward, which led to the terrible famine of the early 1960s. You know, he bl Deng privately thought that all this really grew out of Mao allowing this, indeed encouraging this cult to form around him. And the, he, so he tried to um, dismantle that. 
uh, and but then of course you get the disaster like Tiananmen Square in 1989 the party clamps down uh, and even though the cult of the ruler was still in a, a backseat as it were it only needed President Xi to to arise with this new um, praise of the Maoist era that uh, to, for it to come back you know what they're saying now is we can't distinguish between pre-Mao and post-Mao like Deng Xiaoping did, you know. Um, it's all one period, and we're not allowed to criticize historic mistakes anymore. So it's a very interesting, very interesting period, and uh, um, where it will lead is uncertain at the moment. I mean, there's certainly at the moment, these are very bad signs, aren't they, from Hong Kong, Xinjiang, uh, Inner Mongolia, Tibet, you name it, South China Sea. They are muscular, pushing their nationalism and their power. And some people in Beijing clearly think that the Americans in the Trump era have lost or are losing in a way that they weren't before. So, so it's quite a hinge of fate here, as Churchill would say, between the great powers. And, Obviously, we need America to find its mojo again, uh, to to um, for di diplomacy to triumph here. But it is a it is a difficult moment. But it, uh, for me, and I'm not a sinologist, but it would be it, it would be a mistake to underestimate how these deep rooted characteristics of the civilization in terms of rulership, you know, aren't still working themselves out. I mean, a lot of sinologists in the 1950s were stunned by how the Communist Party, if you like, had reinstated the bureaucratic tyranny of the imperial era, you know, that the, the bureaucracy of the Communist Party was recognizably what they'd been studying in the Ming dynasty. So these are interesting, interesting questions. You, you sound like you're verging on what is the oft misquoted and misattributed Chinese phrase slash curse, may you live in interesting times. And it seems China might be. I'll say. I'll say. Michael, you very kindly agreed to treat us to a reading from the new book, The Story of China, a portrait of, its civil, of a civilization and its people. Would you mind talking us into it, please? And then delighting us with the reading. <laughs> Sure. Well, th this is a piece of storytelling, not a piece of analysis. Um, and uh, as you as you will quickly gather, it's a, a filmmaker's view. But closing in on one of those what I call emblematic moments, midwinter, eighteen ninety nine, uh, the emperor is heading for the the altar of heaven, one of the most ethereal religious sites on earth let alone in China, to perform the ancient rituals, which in various forms have been done for 4,000 years. Uh, the Boxer Rising is burning up the countryside. The imperial powers of Europe and America and Russia and Japan are closing in, and the empire is about to fall, uh, although they don't know it yet. In the freezing December of 1899, two days before the winter solstice, the Guangxi Emperor left the Forbidden City through the Tiananmen Gate at the head of a huge and colourful procession. In a yellow sedan chair borne on the shoulders of 16 scarlet-robed servants, he was carried to a curtained state carriage drawn by a caparisoned elephant. The Emperor wore a yellow court gown with blue dragons and a blue overgarment. On his head, a sable winter cap trimmed with crimson silk and topped by pearl on a gilt spike. Mounted eunuchs in gorgeous silk robes stood by him, followed by an escort of leopard tail guards, imperial grooms in maroon satin imperial liveries, standard bearers with triangular dragon banners and horsemen with bows, gilded quivers and yellow saddle cloths. In all, 2,000 princes Grandees, officers, servants, musicians, and attendants gathered under a steel blue winter twilight sky. Escorted by this brilliant retinue, the emperor headed to the Temple of Heaven, the great imperial shrine on the southern edge of Beijing. Through the central gate of Tianmen and over the marble bridge of heaven, 
cleared of its booths and beggars, the wide street smoothed with yellow sand to stop the carriage bumping on Beijing's frozen, rutted streets. All was hushed. Nothing was allowed to break the silence and profane the rites. Even Beijing's newfangled Siemens electric tramway, laid to the Tata city's south gate only months before, was stopped, its whistles and bells stifled. Leaving the gate, the procession passed into the Chinese city, with its warren of alleys, temples and markets, the side streets screened by huge blue curtains. People were commanded to stay indoors. Houses on the route were shuttered, and foreigners, of whom there were many in the city now, were warned in the English language Peking Gazette not to approach or even look on the emperor. No one was allowed to see him perform his sacred task, still less gaze on his face. He stared impassively ahead, his long pale face with prominent cheekbones already marked by an illness diagnosed by his French physician as chronic nephritis. To those Westerners who'd seen him in public, it was a troubled face, burdened by the excruciating pressure of rulership, the fear of failure, and by his anxious desire to benefit the people. His expressed hope was to make the empire wealthy and powerful again. As he said, if possible, to inaugurate a glorious era, eclipsing our ancestors. Aim for the stars, eh? Aim for the stars. What happened to him? It all ends in tragedy, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, the boxer rising sweeps the country within within uh, days, you know. We're running slightly shy on time. There's a couple of questions I'd like to ask you briefly, if I may. Would you do us the kindness, Mike, of lifting the lid on research, how you get access to documents, how you translate them, are you sign a file yourself? How does, can you talk, talk, tell us a little bit about the modus operandi of how you work? Yeah, I mean, one of the, first of all, I'm not a, a sinologist, of course, and I don't read Chinese, but um, when we did the films, we had uh, both Chinese and English experts on the research team. And it's one of the wonderful things about making a film is you, you're intrigued in a story and you say, well, can we, have we got any eyewitnesses to that? Can we look at that? How do we find out about this? Um, we did a lot of stuff in, in uh, China, and I've transmitted some of this stuff into the into the book with some of these old families who preserve the traditions of their family stories going back hundreds of years. In fact, the last three photographs in the last photo section are are of members of those families, and uh, we filmed with them in making the films. But in doing the book, I actually actually asked a Chinese friend of mine who lives in London, you know, can we phone up Mr. Xia again? I need to know more about this, you know. So um, we'd be phoning up families in China saying, and some of those stories were incredible. I tried to put a lot of women's stories into, into this. And there's some really wonderful stories, extraordinary women. And the really great thing was to, um, you know, one of them comes from a place in Anhui. And I, looking it up, on English language websites, I realized the family was still there, even though she was a great writer in the 1600s. So I asked my Tina to, to phone the family up. And in no time at all, you'd got their family accounts of them still tending her grave. They sent photographs of, uh, you know, uh, uh, Aunt Wei Yi, uh, who, who died in the 1600s. And even better, a uh, wonderful story of a, a Chinese poet who died during the siege of Suzhou in, in 1368 when the Yuan dynasty fell and the Ming took over. And her family name is Zheng. And uh, I know a Chinese professor in Manchester, a colleague of mine, uh, uh, Zheng Yangwen. And I said, she's not your family, is she? And Yangwen said, yes, of course. And when we women still... Uh, read her poetry. She said, do you know her poetry was kept in manuscript for 200 years by the family from 1368 till the 1560s. Only then did the family publish it, you see. But uh, we women 
Uh, even though she married out, she is one of us. So these kind of stories run through the book. You know, So that kind of research is important. And uh, the people research. And there's some really great people research in there. I'm very proud of the the, um, you know, the family stories and stuff that illuminate the tale, you know. And uh, and the, the academic research, of course, you have help, you talk to experts, which is one of the great privileges of making films. You can ask experts advice and, and they're very generous with it. And I worked in the wonderful library of SOAS in London where everything's on the shelves, you know. You're not, you, you can inspect the stacks and you can sit there in between two rows of shelves on a rainy November afternoon and scan those shelves, and to your amazement, somebody actually did write a book about this person in the 1860s or something like that. You know, uh, you, uh, so the, the act of the act of uh, research is, uh, uh, as you know, a f fascinating, thrilling, uh, enticing, illuminating, encouraging. Uh, it it, uh, it is is really an enriching thing to do, even though. The, the, with China, it got more and more daunting as it went along. And when you realize that entire library shelves were devoted to just one aspect of the tale. Well, as I, I, not, as I said to you before we started this show, congratulations on this. It is a huge tour de force. My last question is this, and it's an awful question. I'm signed of it, sort of ashamed of myself for wanting to ask it of the Professor of Public History at the University of Manchester. Because I'm going to ask you for a prediction based on the fact if we don't if we don't know our history, we're going to be forced to repeat it. What do you think the future does hold for the rest of the world's engagement with China, given Hong Kong, South China Sea, Uyghurs, rise of Xi Jinping, Communist Party, and the, the amount of fear that Western media is sort of seeping into our veins of this is the tiger that we have to look out for? Yeah, it's a very difficult uh, time and a very difficult time to make um, forecasts about what's going to happen. I remember talking five years ago to a, a, a Chinese expert, Hong Kong Chinese prof, who said, um, yeah, the signs are not good. He said, they're going to be bad neighbors for some time now. He said, but in the medium term, I'm more optimistic. And I think quite a few people feel that once this generation has passed, you know, you look at President Xi and uh, uh, his many of his colleagues and he's the son of one of the the princes if you like you know his father was the governor of Guangdong and when when um, Guangzhou when uh, the opening up happened in 1979 uh, uh, she did re-education in the countryside as a teenager during the cultural revolution so they're all they're all shaped by that horizon the generation that grows up post Deng Xiaoping's opening up you know that grows up in the, the 90s and the noughties, I think we'll have a different perspective on it. So we all need to kind of hold our horses a little bit over this. Although the, the stories from Xinjiang and, and uh, in Mongolia and Tibet now are not, not, not good. You know, this is, a, this is a bad moment, I think. The clash with India in Ladakh was particularly, you know, tiny, but uh, uh, really deeply unpleasant and troubling so i think uh, i think we all need to be careful but it's in everybody's interest to s try and work together uh, you know the biggest crisis we face in the world is climate and we haven't got very much time to sort that out and we really need china to be on board and china of course has uh, um, declared its support of the paris accords and i think president xi is sincere in his uh, the desire there because of course the Chinese environment has been devastated by the 30 years of communism and then the 30 or 40 years of the opening up you know there's been devastating damage done to it the biggest concern on ordinary Chinese people when you have dinner in their houses is the educated Chinese people is, is uh, leaving questions of the government beside is the the food chain the water table the the environment you know everybody's concerned about it so um, I think there are so many common interests that that's where we should um, aim ourselves in the future. And one really hopes that um, the new American government, which is proceeding uh, in this interregnum very, very carefully and cautiously, um, will, um, will arm itself with wise advice. 
not for the first time do I think we realize that collaboration is how we have survived as a species and it's going to be increasingly important. We have to end there. Michael, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time, for the generosity of your answers. Michael's latest book is entitled, if you haven't already guessed, The Story of China, a portrait of its civilization and people. And it's published by Simon & Schuster and published rather beautifully with a stunning cover, um, nice end papers, and a really lovely sort of teal blue hardcover, which I really like. I want to read you two reviews in case you aren't already inspired to buy it, you should. And here's why. Tom Holland, who knows a thing or two about the scope and breadth of history, has written, this is a learned, wise, wonderfully written single volume history of a civilization that I knew I should know more about. And then Peter Frankopan, who also knows something or two about the scale and scope of a long history, has written, masterful and engrossing, Michael Wood sets out China's rich and complex past in a history that is well-paced, eminently readable, and very well-timed a must read for those who want and need to know about the China of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I've got one last question as a sub, as a rider for you, Michael. Given what you know, given your sources, given your role as a historian and your now profound understanding of the sweep and breadth of China's history, do you get ever consulted at say, governmental level or civil service level for input on what our foreign policy should be towards China? Um, no, and I wouldn't expect to be, not being a China expert, if I can put it that way. I'm not a Sinologist, um, but I but, uh, have been consulted in the past. We, years ago, we made quite a lot, did quite a lot of work in Iraq. And at the time of the first Iraq war, um, because we had filmed inside Iraq and because we then filmed with the, the, the Marsh Arabs, Thesiger's Marsh Arabs and their fate in, in the southern Iraqi marshes. Uh, that's the only time when I, yeah, that's the only time when I've actually been to a, meetings in Whitehall with Chatham House rules where mysterious people have shown us surveillance stuff and all that, you know. No, I'm, my, my task, which uh, is simply the Rethian task, I think, you know. There's the great sinologists and all the wonderful work they produce. There's the dear general public out there. And it, TV, you have to have a link between the two. The scholarship can't just exist in the rarefied world of scholarship. And where, when can we expect you on TV again? What are you working on that we can see on the screens coming up? Not absolutely sure at this moment. Um, uh, we've done an Amer we've done an American version of the Dufu film, and uh, but with the lockdown, we've just been thinking about future ideas. And I've got a I'm at the moment writing a uh, a, a new edition of the of my first book from 40 years ago called In Search of the Dark Ages. Uh, so that's a real uh, interesting kind of throwback, really, to a book that you know for me kicked kicked it all off and uh, and i'm doing a fair amount of work in my academic area of the Ang anglo-saxon history you know academic articles and an academic book coming out in a year or so's time but um but uh, yeah we'll see about tv um we're, we're we've had a lot of approaches from china but are slightly reluctant to use get chinese co-production money given the present climate you know i think one's got to be careful Michael, once again, thank you for joining us here at the Stanford's Travel Writers Festival, the digital version, 2021. Thank you so much for your time, for your reading, and for your gracious answers. It's been a real treat to have a chat with you again. It's been too long. Hopefully, we'll meet up again in the real world very soon. Michael Wood, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure, Paul. Thanks. A real pleasure for all of us. Surely the most animated and captivating of historians, I never fail to find myself hypnotised by Michael's passion and knowledge. Thank you both for that event. The book then, The Story of China, A Portrait of a Civilization and Its People by Michael Wood, is available to buy now at stanfords.co.uk, which is also where you can find the links to 22 other events that comprise this year's Stanford's Travel Writers Festival.